So if you clicked on this video, chances are you've heard terms like blue carbon and black carbon thrown around without really understanding what the heck it's all about. After all, isn't carbon always black? What's all this hippie nonsense about a rainbow of carbons? Don't worry, all your questions and more will be answered in the next 5 minutes. This is Planet Zero. First, let's clarify what is meant by the colors of carbon. It doesn't represent the literal color of the carbon, but it's a label that neatly sums up where the carbon is coming from or going to end up. Older labels tagged carbon as either organic or inorganic, but this didn't narrow down the conversation enough. Color coding on the other hand is much more specific, and allows scientists and policymakers to hone in on the details of our carbon cycle. There's a whole rainbow of carbons to cover, so let's get right into it. Black carbon refers to tiny carbon particles that come from the incomplete combustion of fossil fuels and wood, commonly known as soot. This stuff is not only bad for the planet, but it's also really bad for human health. These black carbon particles are so tiny that they can easily penetrate the lungs and put toxic chemicals in our bloodstream. They also do a great job of warming the planet since black things just absorb more heat. When black carbon gets on ice, it speeds up the melting process and has a warming impact on our climate that's 460 to 1500 times stronger than CO2. It's some nasty stuff, no doubt about it. Brown carbon is very similar to black carbon. It's a carbon aerosol that comes from the incomplete combustion of biomass, such as forest fires, along with some other natural sources. The difference between brown carbon and black carbon is that brown carbon is smaller and doesn't absorb as much light, giving it a kind of hazy, smoggy look instead of clouds of soot. Once in the atmosphere, it goes through all kinds of crazy atmospheric chemistry, making it hard to know just how much it contributes to climate change. Still probably a good idea to keep this stuff out of our air. Gray carbon, the last of our anthropogenic carbon sources, is simply the CO2 coming from industry. This covers the carbon emitted from the steel industry, cement production, making fertilizers, and chemical manufacturing to name a few. Why this carbon gets its own color and not the carbon coming from electricity or transportation is beyond me. And I don't know if gray really counts as a color, but I digress. Red carbon is the last color of carbon that contributes to a warmer planet. This stuff is a little weird as it's the carbon associated with microbes that live on ice. These microbes often make red pigments designed to absorb light in order to melt the ice they live on. This meltwater is then used by the microbes to survive. While this melting isn't caused by climate change, it is a factor that contributes to our ice caps melting, so it's important to understand the role it will play in our future climate scenarios. Green carbon, the first of our good carbons, is the carbon stored in terrestrial ecosystems. This is all the carbon that's locked away in plant life and the soil they grow in. Keeping the green carbon numbers high will be essential in the fight against climate change, preventing forest fires, responsible soil management, and protecting old growth forests from logging will all be needed to keep our green carbon values high. Blue carbon is just like green carbon, except it's the carbon that's stored in the ocean. This includes dissolved CO2 in seawater, aquatic plant life, and sediments buried in the ocean floor. Blue carbon is incredibly stable and can stay locked in the ocean for hundreds or even thousands of years. This is why many scientists have been actively researching ways to increase our blue carbon stocks, as it is one of the safest ways to pull carbon out of our atmosphere on long timescales. Now in between blue carbon and green carbon, we find, shockingly, teal carbon, which is the carbon locked away in freshwater ecosystems like lakes, rivers, and wetlands. The most famous example of teal carbon would probably be mangrove forests, which form these dense webs of roots that sequester carbon deep in the soil. While teal carbon is often overlooked or grouped in with blue carbon, it represents a unique and critical component of the carbon cycle. The health and safety of our wetlands will play a vital role in keeping the climate as stable as possible. The last color of carbon in our bizarre, incomplete rainbow is purple carbon. This is a relatively new moniker that refers to carbon that has been captured from the air or from industrial emissions. You may have heard of direct air capture, where giant fans scrub CO2 from the air and store it underground. These, along with carbon capture technology installed directly over smokestacks, are increasing the stocks of purple carbon. While these are nowhere near as robust as they need to be to solve climate change, gathering more of this purple carbon will allow humanity to start cleaning up the mess it has made over the last 200 years. So there you have it, the rainbow of carbon in all its glory. Despite the unfortunate reality that carbon doesn't actually form a pretty rainbow, 
These labels help streamline the conversation about moving towards a carbon neutral future. By focusing on protecting our carbon reservoirs and cutting back on nasty carbon pollution, we can shift society towards a more sustainable tomorrow. Hopefully now you can see this dull little element with a little more complexity, showing its true colors through a rainbow tinted lens. Thanks for sticking around to the end. If you have any questions about the rainbow of carbons, I would love to hear them in the comment section. As always, the sources are all linked in the description. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to support Planet Zero. I'll see you next time.